morning. It is good to look out and see you this day, and I hope that you enjoyed the, the weather this week. Wasn't it kind of nice? You know, everybody always complains about the weather in July. I'm probably the king of complainers when it comes to that. But it seemed like it's always typical, this last week here like that, because this next week kids start fall sports and football practice, and then it goes back up into the upper 90s, and I always we got that lull before the the storm of uh, having to get involved in all of that when I was in school. And it does not seem like I don't think it's changed. <laughs> you would take your Bibles to uh, turn it to that book of Acts and the, look a little bit at the 27th and the 28th chapters. We want to be looking at the commitment of the church or in the church. If you can picture in your mind's eye a uh, a soldier. At Valley Forge and he's holding in his hand a, a musket and his hands are bloody and he he stands barefoot in the snow he's he's hungry from a lack of food uh, he has wounds from the months of battle he's emotionally scarred because he's spent an eternity away from his family and he's surrounded by nothing but death and the carnage of war and he stands tough. And in his eyes, you can see fire. And he has victory in his heart. And he looks across the centuries in anger and disgust. And he says, I gave you a birthright of freedom born in the Constitution. And now our children graduate too illiterate to read and to read it. I fought in the snow barefoot to give you freedom to, to vote, and you stay home because it rains. I left my family destitute to give you freedom of speech, and you remain silent on the critical issues because it just might be bad for business. You badmouth the country because you're irritated by something a politician does. I offered my children to give you a government to serve you, and you are apathetic when democracy is stolen from the people. It's a soldier, not the reporter, that gives you freedom of press. It's a soldier, not the poet, that gives you freedom of speech. It's a soldier, not the campus organizer, who allows you to demonstrate. It's the soldier who salutes the flag serves the flag, whose coffin is draped with the flag that allows the protester to burn the flag. Shame. Shame. And then he prays. Lord, hold our troops in your loving hands. Protect them as they protect us. Bless them and their families for the selfless acts of heroism they perform for us in our time be close to them and bring them the hope of just coming home safe. Freedom is not free. The slogan is simple. You can differ, but you can't divide. You see, freedom is a responsibility. Freedom is a responsibility. I don't know that there's a better definition that correctly displays the real meaning of of being free. Paul, in the letter to the Galatian church there in, in chapter 5, in Galatians 5, 1, he says, Christ has set us free. This means we are really free. He would go on then in verse 13 to say, my friends, you were chosen to be free, so don't use your freedom as an excuse to do anything that you want, but use it as an opportunity to serve each other Freedom isn't free. It's a responsibility. And those who deny their, their personal obligations only lead us back to the bondage and of before, of the past. You know, as Americans, we love the Bill of Rights, don't we? At least we should. <laughs> the Bill of Rights are great. But tell me, as an American, who has the right to spit on our flag and burn it while chanting, We want freedom! Paul said there in verse 15 in Galatians 5, if you want to act like wild animals, hurting and harming each other, then watch out. 
because you will be completely destroying one another. You know, when Paul wrote those words, there was a tyrannical leader who was in charge, a bloody leader, Nero. He was the Caesar who made himself a Roman god. Himself the god. And so Paul didn't want to fly any banner. He just wanted to be a Christian. He didn't lead a protest march. He, he didn't come up with some dirty name to call Nero or the, the Roman Forum. He just simply wanted to be a Christian and have the banner of Christ. In the book Fall, The Fall by Albert Camus, I once frustrated some literary people when I was teaching at the, at, at, at the college, and I, I didn't call him Albert Camus, I called him Albert Camus intentionally, just to kind of maybe rile him a little bit. But Albert Camus, Albert Camus uh, he had a, a character in this book, The Fall, that explains that that he never crosses a bridge at night because he was afraid that somebody might jump into the water and, and then he would be confronted with making a decision of whether or not he would become involved in attempting to rescue this person. See, the fear of responsibility is what he was running from. The fear of responsibility has kept a lot of people from doing a lot of things. It's kept people from getting married. It's kept people from becoming involved in the work of the church. It's kept people from being involved in leadership. Flight from responsibility is escape into the realm of selfishness. Where life is lived without any thought for anyone else but herself. Now, no doubt, every person has some time wished that they weren't quite so obligated. Responsibility ties us down. Responsibility keeps us from doing the certain things that we do. Responsibilities can weigh heavy on our shoulders because others are depending on us. Author and lecturer Dennis Waitley said, uh, there should be a statute of responsibility standing in the Los Angeles Harbor or the San Francisco Harbor that would be a replica, but it's called the Statue of Responsibility like the Statue of Liberties in New York Harbor. Because it, it's, a, it's a statue that would say that without self-control and individual responsibility, there can be no liberty and there can be no freedom. You see, in Christ, we not only have received liberty, forgiveness, freedom from sin, but we also have the responsibility to share that gift of liberty, share that gift of freedom with those who are still in the bondage and in an entanglement of sin. You know, these last several weeks, we've been going through this series on the, the church in the book of Acts and the church today and trying to make the connection with the church that we read about in the book of Acts and the same responsibilities that they had are responsibilities that we have today. And, and we bear responsibility for, for some of those things. There, there's really no life apart from being responsible. Paul here gives us today, as we're kind of winding this down in the latter part of the book of Acts, and he gives us a very vivid study of what commitment in the church is all about. And I hope that we can see from three things here this morning what commitment in the church is for us today. Let's see, I hope Rick is moving it along. There we go. Three things that commitment means. And the first is commitment means additional problems. Additional problems. In verse 20 of Acts 28, Paul, Paul writes here, he says, I ask you to come here today so that, so that we could get acquainted and so that I could tell you that I 
and bound, actually, excuse me, I said Luke, or Paul writes, it was Luke who wrote the book of Acts, so let me clarify that. But he says, I, I ask you to come here so we can get acquainted so I can tell you that I am bound with chains because I believe that the hope of Israel, the Messiah, has already come. Now, following three tours of missionary journeys and tours of duty with uh, all the hardships and all the difficulty, Paul at last returned to Jerusalem. Upon coming back to home, he is falsely accused almost immediately of bringing a Gentile into the temple area. And had it not been for the Roman soldier that was nearby, Paul's Jewish countrymen would have killed him right there on the spot. As it was, he found himself in prison in Caesarea for two years. During that time, he pled his case before the governors of Felix and the governor Festus, and also before King Agrippa. And repeatedly, the Jews sought to just tear him apart. They wanted him to be turned over to their authority. They wanted him dead. They thought that if we kill Paul, we can kill this movement. They didn't recognize that from learning the lesson that crucifying Jesus did not shut the gospel down, did it? But that's what they were wanting to do. They thought if we killed Paul, they wanted him dead. And when all else failed, Paul then, he demands his rights as a, as a Roman citizen for his case to be heard in Rome. He wanted to change a venue. He knew he wasn't going to get a fair shake in Jerusalem. They hated him fiercely. And so he begins this journey by ship to Rome. And once there, he spends another two years in jail. And even though he's allowed to live in his private quarters, a rented quarters that he's paying the rent on, a guard was stationed with him all the time. And all of these things happen because of the hate of his fellow countrymen. They hated him that much. You know, it would have been so easy for Paul to just throw his hands up and, and just, just say, hey, after the way you treat him, I'll never do it again. I kind of envision a little bit of Barney Fife going in there when he gets upset and he goes, what do you get? Heartache! Nothing but heartache! You know, that's the kind of the way the Apostle Paul had to have, have been thinking. That I, I'm never going to reach out and, and, and try to share the gospel of Christ to anybody again because it's not doing anything for me. It's just getting me in trouble. You go, somebody else go serve. I can't take it anymore. Raymond McHenry wrote a eulogy, the eulogy of someone else, in which he writes, Our church is deeply saddened by the passing of an irreplaceable member, someone else. For all these years, he did far more than any other church member. Whenever leadership was mentioned, someone else was looked to for inspiration and achievement. Whenever there was a job to do, a class to teach, a meeting to attend, everybody always turned to someone else. It was common knowledge that someone else was among the largest contributors of the church. And whenever there was a financial need, everyone just assumed that someone else would make up the difference. And although we are grieved by the loss of someone else, his death comes as no big surprise. He was far too overworked and continually stretched too thin. In fact, we may have contributed to his death by expecting too much out of someone else. He left a wonderful example to follow, but it appears that there's nobody willing to fill the shoes of someone else. And I shudder to think of what will happen now to our church since we can no longer depend on someone else. You know, it's true that if Paul would have, have, have walked away from his responsibilities, if he would have let someone else bear the burden. You know what? He would have never known the physical abuse. <clears throat> Paul would have never known the imprisonment. He would have never been shipwrecked. None of his problems would have he had to endure. And when we walk away from our responsibilities, we take a chance <laughs> that someone else will step up to the plate speak the truth to someone else. Paul 
was committed to the spread of the gospel. He knew that the Christian faith was the true fulfillment and God's hope for God's people. He knew that Jesus and the kingdom of God were the true fulfillment of the law of Moses and the prophets. And that his ancestral faith of the Jews found fulfillment in the Christian faith. Paul knew that the stakes were high. He knew that if, if people were to turn their back and reject Jesus Christ, that they had nothing but hopelessness. Their plight would be hopeless. They would be lost. And he wasn't willing to risk that on someone else. Commitment means enduring additional problems. Not walking away from responsibility because the stakes are Secondly, commitment means and brings assurance in the storm. You know, the life of commitment enables one to stand in the middle of life's storms and to stand with some certain assurance. <laughs> As Paul was being transported by ship to, to Rome, in what they had anticipated was like a day cruise, Okay, they just thought this is a piece of cake. This is just a short jump. But what the sailors had not figured on was that they were also going to be dealing with a huge change in the weather. They didn't have KY3's AccuWeather forecast to look at. You know, they didn't have any of that there at their disposal. They had to actually look out and read the sky to some degree. And they didn't know this, this weather was coming up and fast approaching. And ancient ships, they just weren't able to, to tack or, or to face heavy seas. And, and these ancient ships, what they would do many times with the fierce weather like that is that they had really no other option just than to run with the wind and try to get away from land. So they wouldn't be brought into the land. This ship back then was not heavy or was heavy and so whatever they needed to do in order it was probably taking on water with the storm and so they start jettisoning their cargo they start throwing it overboard to make it lighter and the whole crew i don't, I don't know i always thought of seamen as very very tough you know you read those kind of stories but but they just it's almost like in the how in the scriptures they almost cry like little girls when it's bad weather at least these guys were. Maybe it's because they didn't have faith for certain. But they, they were crying. They were scared because they were fearful of this weather. And then Paul stands up and offers a word of encouragement. And he, he also throws in what I think is kind of interesting. His, uh, you know, it's all too human. I told you so. I don't know. But in Acts 27 and 21 uh, is where he tells them that. But in verse 22 he says, But take courage, none of us was going to lose our lives even though the ship is going to go down. For last night an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and he said, Don't be afraid, Paul, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you, so take courage. For I believe God, it will be just as he said. And suddenly the prisoner here becomes the master of the situation. Because Paul had assurance. He had assurance because he believed in the power and the providential care of Almighty God. God had revealed that this part of his purpose was this journey to Rome. And with knowledge that God's purpose would not be frustrated, Paul was very firm in the fact that we have hope. And he gave that to these people and other passengers and these sailors. See, because Paul's life had been given over to the responsibility of discipleship, he knew that even this storm even this difficulty was a part of God's plan for his ministry. 
the kind of faith that led him to say for the hope of Israel, I am bound in these chains. Long before the storm came down, Paul had learned that there was foolishness like that foolishness of a young ox who is kicking at the, the harnesses, pulling against the harness. Remember, in his conversion experience there on the road to Damascus, Paul realized the foolishness of rebelling against God. And when a man has lived day after day in the service of the Lord, he's not taken back when the storms of life come. You know, our world is bought into this misconception that unless things are going well, the seas are going to be calm and tranquil. And if they're not calm and tra tranquil, then the Lord must just not be working in that circumstance or situation. Remember another boat on another sea and another group of passengers? <coughs> and the winds and the waves came up as Jesus had taken a nap in the bottom of the boat. And the disciples are so fearful, and they wake him up, and they say, don't you care that we perish? And Jesus rebuked the wind, he rebuked the waves, and he rebuked the disciples. But he says, peace, be still. Now let me ask you this. When was there a time in that boat that the disciples were not in the presence of the Lord? When was there a time? I mean, he was with them in the storm, he was with them in the calm. And you know what? The same is true for Paul. And the same is true for you. And the same is true for me. And that's some encouragement we certainly need to pass on to some of our brothers and sisters that are part of this congregation that are going through some difficult times. That God is with them in the storm just like he is in the calm. But they are never alone. One of uh, Sir Humphrey Gilbert's voyages in, in one of them, his crew was begging him to turn around because they were fearful that they were going out into some uncharted seas. And sailors don't like uncharted seas. They want to know where they're going just like anybody else. And he, he refused. And Sir Gilbert said, I am as near to God by sea as I ever was by land." Commitment realizes that the Lord is in the calm. Commitment realizes that the Lord is in the storm. There is assurance wherever the Christian goes. The third thing, the commitment is spending life for what's eternal. Paul wasn't successful in every venture that he undertook. Sometimes I think we forget, I think we forget that fact. He wasn't always successful. You know, there's a lot of people heard him preach. And those folks walked away. And they didn't look up, as we were talking about in Sunday school. You know, even in Rome, though he testified it to all who would listen, in Acts 28, verse 24 says, some were convinced by what he said, and others would not believe. Apparently, the predominance of the, of the, uh, of the Jewish population still was turning their back on they were rejecting Jesus as the Christ. And so Paul quotes from the prophet Isaiah and applies this to his own ministry. When he says, the Holy Spirit was right when he said to our ancestors through Isaiah the prophet, go and say to my people, you will hear my words, but you will not understand. You will see what I do, but you will not perceive in meaning. For the hearts of these people are hardened and their ears cannot hear. And they've closed their eyes so their eyes cannot see and their ears cannot hear and their hearts cannot understand and they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. Though the multitudes had turned away, there were still a few who heard and believed. And even when Paul made his way from the seaport there, and he comes <clears throat> by way uh, of the, uh, the Appian Way and the place that's known in the text is the three taverns, some 33 miles from Rome. The language that's described there is talking about like a group coming out in a, in a reception to meet them in an official capacity, a, a, a greeting uh, of folks like, like they were greeting a great general. 
who had just won many, many battles. You see, wherever a Christian goes, wherever they go on this earth, they're never alone. Isn't that comforting? We're never alone. There are always those around who are united with us in the fellowship of Christ. Even though there may be those that may be united with us, but they may not even be in our physical presence, but we're still united in heart and mind. And we know we got brothers and sisters that are with us. The Hebrew writer tells us in Hebrews 12 that we are surrounded, we are enveloped, we are encompassed by a great cloud of witnesses. And so when life gets hard, when life sometimes gets difficult for us as Christians, we need to remind one another to walk the hard path is a part of our responsibility. Like the mighty army moves the church of God, the hymn the writer says. Brothers, we are treading where the saints have trod. You know, when one is filled with the knowledge that his life is being spent for things that are eternal, the particular circumstances of life are relatively unimportant. You know, during the two years that Paul was at Rome, was in prison. He writes the biggest chunk of the New Testament. He writes the, the letter to the churches there in Ephesus, he, in Philippi, in Colossae. He writes a letter to Philemon in behalf of another brother. And as he writes to the church at Philippi, he explains the purpose of his imprisonment. And that everything that was happening to him was happening so that the gospel could spread. The good news of Jesus Christ could go forth. And what Paul was saying, that when, when one is in the will of God, all the circumstances merely contribute more powerfully to our witness. See, too often we, we just want to focus on the results. We just want to focus on the outcome. We are so outcome-driven that we forget the process of how it, we got there. And, and, you know, the problem here is outcome is not our worry. That's God's. And it's God's alone. It's not our concern. God desires for you and for me to be faithful. To be faithful. That's what he desires for us, is our faithfulness. You know, one greater chapter remained to be written in the life of Paul because following his two-year imprisonment in Rome, he was released and he made a trip to Spain, according to tradition. And following that, it seems likely that he was arrested somewhere around Ephesus, and then he was transported by way of Greece back to Rome, where it was during the great persecution of Nero. And it's there where Paul was beheaded. But shortly before his execution, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, we read these words. He said, as for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought a good fight. I finished the race. I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness that the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that great day of his return and the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his glorious return. Friends, do we look forward to God's glorious return? You see, the story that began on the road to Damascus some 30 years before, they thought ended at the executioner's block in Rome. But the story, did it end there? Did Paul's ministry stop just because they lopped off his head? No. The growth of the church had just begun. And others took up the self-giving commitments of which real life is composed. You know, Paul was a great scholar. Paul was a great man of courage. But that's not what he's known for. He's remembered because he was totally committed to Jesus Christ. He was totally committed to his church. 
Paul lived in obscurity. He lived in the, the shadow of some mighty Caesars. But you know, his life was just as bright and shining even brighter than that of Rome. Because his life knew the fullness that comes only from commitment. You know, I know at times it gets frustrating for us and we wonder, who can, I, who can I touch? Who do I have that comes across my path? Where can I go? What can I do? What can I say? You know, the story, the question we have to really ask, I guess, is what's the story of your life and mine? What is it? What's the story of your life and mine? Is it a story of commitment? Will we be remembered for all the grand and glorious things that we do, or will we be remembered that we're just totally sold out to Jesus Christ, that we want to be faithful to Jesus Christ? Forget all the accolades. I know I want somebody to just say he was faithful to his Lord, his wife, his family, and his friends. What better than that? But it all begins by making a commitment. It all begins with our making the commitment to make Jesus Christ Lord and Savior. And when we made that commitment, when we by faith committed our lives to Jesus Christ, when we were obedient to him and his command to be buried in a water grave so that we could rise to walk in newness of life, he commands for us to die to self so that we can live for him. Commitment begins with surrender. Surrendering our all to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so very much for the opportunity and privilege that's ours as your children to come here this day in this place. Father, for us a chance to open your word. And I pray, Father, that we would all be encouraged. We would be willing, Father, to look at the problems of life and to say, it's all good. It's all worth it because the risks are too high. If we if we don't endure. Father, for us to, to recognize the, the, the assurances that you bring to us, the hope that we have because of Christ. And we leave a legacy, Father, that lives on beyond us for all eternity. Help us, Lord, to be faithful. Faithful servants of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We ask this in the most precious and holy name, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Friends of